Good morning. Welcome to Walnut Creek Baptist Church, and we're excited to see everybody this morning. And we're going to begin our service by singing, May Jesus Be Praised. Let's all stand together and we'll sing through four stanzas of May Jesus Be Praised. When morning kills the skies, my heart awaking cries, may Jesus Christ be praised. Alike at work and prayer, to Jesus I repair. May Jesus Christ be praised. May Jesus be praised. May Jesus be praised. In all I do. be praised. Good to have all of you here this morning. Good to have all of you uh, check in your children and junior church, and we'll look forward to that. I have a little more to say about that later, and of course, it's Father's Day. We have a special gift for all the dads. As you exit, we'll have somebody there. There's a booklet for you. I think all of you would uh, like, uh, there would be especially important for the dads. It's a little devotional we have for the dads when you leave, and we want to thank all the fathers coming. Good to see some people we haven't seen in a while. And uh, God is so, so good. How many of you are glad that God is still on the throne? Say amen. amen. You know, it's through times like we've gone through, which is literally nothing compared to our grandparents that they've gone through in World War II and things like that. But yet, this has been a special time that we should all get close to God, realize who Jesus Christ is, 
and allow him be the centerpiece of our life. And uh, let's open in a word of prayer and have a few other things to say. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege it is and how we've taken it so for granted that we can gather together. And Lord, thank you for allowing us to meet together as a family here this morning. And I do pray that, Lord, our fellowship would be sweet. I pray, Lord, for the preaching of God's word, that it would uh, light a candle in a dark world. And Lord, I pray for those here today that are struggling with salvation, that you would speak to them in the, in the area of knowing who Jesus Christ is and for the forgiveness of their sins. And I pray for all of us this morning, so many of our hurting brothers and sisters that are watching right now online, and Lord, we lift them up, and we lift up those battling cancer, and we have several in our church family that are dealing with that. Lord, we lift up those that are battling relationships that have gone south and Lord there's so much that we need to bring before you today but let's lift up the Lord Jesus Christ as our opening song said let Jesus Christ be praised and we'll thank you for it in Christ's name I pray amen and amen God bless you you may be seated as we've been doing we have a special and we give you can give online right now and those watching can do as well and uh, we do have offering boxes as you come in, as you leave, for those who are here, which would like to put their offering in the box as you leave and as you come in. We've been uh, above budget for the most of this pandemic, in fact, all of it, but a few weeks, and that's been a real blessing. And again, I think it says a lot to the spiritual maturity of Christians that they give in spite of having to gather together, and we really, really appreciate that. We would like to finish the chairs in the church. We'll be talking about that later and get this uh, auditorium finished. But before we go any further, we just want to make sure where this thing is going before we spend any more money. But we're glad you're here and thank the Lord for you right now as we uh, take the offering, those at home and also here. And we have a special right now as well. And I believe it's the Emus family, I believe.
Good job, Chance. That was wonderful. I know many people watching online are excited about that and excited to see you singing. Uh, today's Father's Day, and uh, as I said, we have a special gift for all the dads when you uh, leave here, and uh, you can get there'll be a basket you can pull that out of. But what I'd like to do is recognize all the dads today, and if you're a father and you're responsible for somebody walking planet Earth, uh, <laughs> let's all stand together. I want to see all the dads stand up. Can we have all the dads stand up? Please, all the fathers stand up. And uh, all right. Well, it's good to have all of you here. And I think I know who the oldest father is. Jack, how old are you? 92. 92. All right. So I, is there anybody older than 92? Jack, are you? No, you're okay. All right. Yeah, all right. All right. No. All right. Let's give them a round of applause. Can we do that? All the dads. All right. Just look around. You know how hard it is to be a father today? And uh, all right, you may be seated. We have a video today, and I thought about, we like to show different videos, and I thought, let's show something that's a little lighthearted. You know, how many of you think we need to laugh some, right? So I want you to watch this. This is really cute. We are able to purchase this and some others, but I want you to watch this special Father's Day message. I wish the children were up here watching this because this really relates to them as well. But let's watch this right now, and then we have a song. No matter how old we are, we always remember what our dads say and do. My dad is more like Jesus than your dad. Nuh-uh. My dad doesn't let anybody eat any food until we pray for it. My dad prays for one minute every day. You know what? Our church has pancakes. This is what my sister and mom use for their blush. My dad says that mean kids never know what they're talking about. Because their parents don't know what they're talking about either. My dad says to punch meanies in the face. Then my mom says, don't ever do that. And my dad goes to time out. <laughs> My dad's beard is itchy whenever he kisses me. <laughs> My dad takes me to church so we could learn to be just like Jesus. My daddy prays for me. Then he makes me stop talking and go to bed. Then I get a flashlight and read my comic book. That's a sin. He's sinning. No, I'm not. Sinner. No, I'm not. R2. 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 My dad said that if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. My dad never stays mad at me. My dad taught me to forgive, because Jesus forgives us every time we ask. I want a mohawk. I wish I had hair. It's OK. Your hair will probably grow back. Thanks for being our dads for all our lives. Let's stand and take our Bibles out, and we're going to look in the Gospel of John, chapter number 5. John, chapter 5. And pastor's bringing a message this morning, you can see titled, What More Could I Have Done? And we'll find uh, that concept out of John 5, and we'll be looking in verses 31 to 47, John chapter 5, verses 31 through the end of the chapter, John 5, 31 through 47. The Word of God says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth, but I receive not testimony from man. But these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me, given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me 
that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? And the Lord will add his blessing to our reading of his holy word this morning. We're going to conclude our singing with the hymn, Rejoice in the Lord. seated. Our pastor is coming in just a moment with this morning's message.
Well, very good. Appreciate the service so far, the singing, and all of the, uh, everything that's uh, been done downstairs. If you haven't had a chance to uh, see our new check-in system, it's probably not a good time to check it out now unless you have a child, but a lot of work was gone into that. Appreciate Ann, Debbie DiPolito, and others that have put that together. It's been a, uh, a uh, somewhat of a monumental task to meet back together with social distancing and all that taking place, but I think we've done a very good job of putting that together, and I appreciate not just myself and my wife, but all those who've helped out getting our church back going again. I want you to look at John chapter number 5. John chapter number 5. This is the remainder of the message at the poolside. And this particular point, this message, everybody listen and listen please. We're without excuse. There's nothing that we can say to God in the end where we can blame God, I didn't know, I didn't know any better. And we often say this to our children. We often say things like, what more could have I done? What more could have been done to show you who Christ is? I want you to look at Verse number 40. And this somewhat summarizes this portion of Scripture. Look what it says, please. It says, kind of a summarization of it, And ye will not come to me, talking about Christ is speaking, that ye might have life. In other words, I've done a whole lot of things. I've revealed myself. I've shown myself, and you still don't believe. What more could I have done? I want to preach a message I simply titled, What More Could I Have Done? Let's pray together, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the fellowship. I thank you for all those dear saints and sweet people that are watching this morning on Facebook, YouTube, our website. And Lord, I thank you for the privilege we have to boldly proclaim the gospel, the good news in this church. I pray that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit. I pray for those here this morning that are struggling with salvation. Lord, that you will open the hearts and minds of these individuals. I also pray for people that are saved, that know Christ is their Savior, that this morning they will realize that Maybe there's areas in their life that they need to address. And I know for this next category, there are dozens of people that just need to rest in your presence this morning. They're really struggling. Health, relationships, finances, whatever it may be. I pray, Lord, for everyone here that is in this physical building and those watching as well. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. Well, we're coming to the close of this discourse by the pool at Bethesda. Jesus is reviewing with the Jews what he had done so far. What his ministry had been, and it's a short period of time, we're less than a third of the way into it at this point. And he's reviewing with the Jews and the scribes what he had done to point that he is Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Redeemer, the one that they had been waiting for. And the evidence, ladies and gentlemen, is overwhelming. The love of God was so evident as to what God had done to reveal himself to the people. But yet, with all the evidence, they right here, are rejecting. An evangelist who was at our church, actually spoke of the wilds a number of times, he was with a preacher friend of his down in South Carolina. And there was a young man that was in jail for life for killing a young girl. And he went with the dad 
of that young man and visiting this man in prison. And on the way to the prison, the father was sharing how they raised their kids. And the pastor, the evangelist that was here, said, I knew the family. It wasn't one of those pastor's homes where, you know, there's one thing in church and something else on the side. He believed he lived a a consistent Christian life, not that he was perfect and we're all a sinner saved by grace, but he said, he said, I gave my son a loving home. I gave him a home where he knew mom and dad loved him, and there was forgiveness in this home. He was raised in a Christian family. We gave him an opportunity, and he did. He went off to college, and we were able to sacrifice for him, and we believe that was a great sacrifice because we wanted our, our child to, to go to college, give him opportunities. And he looked at the evangelist. You know what he said to him? I don't know what more I could have done. Now, there is not sin that I can point to, and I'm not saying, excuse me, I'm not in sinless perfection. But what more could I have done? And ladies and gentlemen, please, as we look at the Scriptures this morning, that's what Jesus Christ is saying right here in this text. Look what I've done. What more could I have done? I saw recently there was a video, there's a flood out somewhere in the Midwest, and there was a, a dog, and they were trying to rescue this dog. It was on a log. And they were trying to rescue this dog, and, and they, they, they got a pole, and the dog would not even look at the pole. They thought maybe a dog would be like, you know, one of those smart dogs you see on TV that bites the pole and you pull him in. This dog wasn't that smart, so that didn't work. A man reached out his hand, and he couldn't reach the dog, and the log floated a little further away before it got stuck on a rock or something like that. There was torrent floodwaters coming. Then they got a chain of people to extend it, and the dog didn't even want. The dog was turning away from the only thing that could help that dog. The dog would eventually not accept the help fell into the floodwaters, and it's just went away. We're not sure what happened. What more could have been done? Jesus says in this text, describing what had been done to reveal himself as the Redeemer and Savior, what more could I have done? Isaiah 5 says this, Now will I, verse number 1, Now will I sing to my well-beloved song of my beloved concerning or touching his vineyard. My well-beloved have a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. Now he's describing what God has done. He fenced it, he gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with a choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it. The tower was to protect it. And also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, Isaiah says, and men of Judah, judge, I pray to you between me and my vineyard, what could have been done? What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done it, done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. So let's speak the first, let's go through this text this morning. Number one, what more could I have done? I sent a person. I sent a person. Now let's look at the verse number 33. Number one, I sent a person. You sent unto John. In other words, they're saying there, the people are saying, you folks sent out to John. And God's saying, I sent you John the Baptist. You sent unto John and bear witness unto his truth, but I received not the testimony for men. That's Jesus speaking. But these things I say that you might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light. And ye were, now don't miss this, please look at the last part of that verse. I think we have it on the screen as well. You were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. See, God sent a witness. What more could I have done? I sent you a person to tell of the light of Christ. Having introduced the greatest of all witnesses, John the Baptist, the Lord turned to the testimony and reminded the unbelieving Jews that 
They actually sent men out to hear John, to hear what he had to say. It was all about the Lord, Jesus Christ. He introduced the testimony of John the Baptist since he was a man sent from God, since he testified that the Lord Jesus was indeed the Messiah, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And look here, I sent you a person. It is incredibly hot in here. I'm going to find out whoever invented the suit coat when I get to heaven, if they're, per, if they're even there, <laughs> and say, why did you bring this cultural thing into my life that gave me so much anguish? Anyway, you just lost your spiritual, it's just all gone, just poof, it went away. Anyway, I sent you a person. You ignored him. You may have listened to him for a while, maybe at Christmas and Easter, but ultimately you rejected what he said. Now, I can't speak for anybody else. I can only speak for me. Now, I want everybody to listen. I look back on my life, and I can see how God sent people into my life all the way back to when I was a child. And maybe the application here of John the Baptist, the forerunner, the one that was prophesied, to John the Baptist in the wilderness, prepare ye for the way of the Lord. As a teenager, I remember playing football, and I went into the locker room, and as I was sitting there taking my cleats off, Tim Tebow, who was not even a, a future thought at the time, his father was sitting in the locker room with me, and he talked to me about the Lord. He was with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and he says, why don't you come? We're going to, rather than going out with others, why don't you come with us? We're going to read about the Bible and have a study after the game tonight. And I said, no. God sent that man to my life. No. I remember being invited to a revival and listening, but yet I was not there. I remember as an engineering student at Auburn University having this guy that I studied with, and, and my wife remembers who it was, and he was a Christian. And you know why he hung around with us? I have no idea, but he was witnessing to us. God sends people, ladies and gentlemen, in our lives all the time. And maybe if you're a Christian here today, listen to me, you're the person that God wants to use for somebody else. I remember a mom and dad that talked about us coming to know Christ. Let me ask you a question, all of us. Let's make it real practical here this morning. How many more people does God have to put in your path? Seriously? See, Jesus is saying, I sent you John the Baptist. If you have an outline Bible, some have Schofield, different Bibles, they call this the fourfold witness to Jesus. I'm not following that outline, but there are four things here. So what more could I have done? And then he says, why would you accept him so warmly at the beginning, but then it was just for a season? Number two, I sent you a problem, or I solved the problem. I put a problem in your life so I could reveal myself to you. Now, by the way, there are people sitting here this morning, and those watching, you can so relate to this, because if it wasn't a problem that came into your life, I don't know Christ ever would have become a part of your life. Now, let's look at verse 36. Now, we'll kind of walk through this and unpack it for a moment. But I have a greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do. Bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Now look at verse 37. In other words, the Father has sent me. Verse 37, the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness in me, he hath neither heard his voice at any time nor seen a shape. In other words, I was sent, in verse 36, it says there, the Father had given me to finish the same works that I do, the works, to bear witness the Father has sent me. In other words, I perform miracles to reveal who I am. The works. The works which the Father had given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness to me. John uses the expression here, the works, in this gospel, 
to depict both the natural and supernatural life of Christ and all the ministry he did of demonstrating his deity while being in humanity. Many works. I can go through a bunch of them. I will just reference a few. All this added up to be an impressive proof that he had been sent into this world by the Father, not just born into this world like other people. So many varied works that the Christ did. And there were problems that were solved. Think about this. We have no food on the seashore, so I'm going to feed 5,000. A problem came, a problem solved. I healed the blind man at the pool of Bethesda. Excuse me, I, I, healed the, I made the lame to walk at the pool of Bethesda. I healed the blind. The dead were ri- raised, Lazarus, Jairus' son, and the widow's son, widow's, uh, Jairus' daughter, and the widow's son, and Lazarus. I healed, I mean, I made the the dead to rise again. I made the deaf to hear. I cast out demons. I solved problems that came into your life, or at least you could have seen the problem in somebody else's life, but yet you ignored it all. By the way, Jesus Christ did not perform miracles. He did not feed people, heal people, clothe people, just to do that. He did all of that to reveal who he was. If he was there to heal, clothe, and take care of all of the problems in the world, he did a pretty rotten job because he didn't do it. There's still people with him. It was all to reveal who he was. Psalm 18.6 says this, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Maybe God has put a problem in your life and in my life, so we will cry unto the Lord. Sometimes God puts us in a position that it's only He's going to get you out of this. I gave you a problem. I solved a problem. We don't like problems. We don't like them sending our way, but yet God may send us a problem. And how many times have people said, oh, thank you, Jesus, for whatever. And then it's forgotten. Then it's forgotten. In a hospital, in a marriage, some in depression, God will put a problem in your life, now don't miss this, to reveal himself to you. And even if you're saved, you know Christ is your Savior, problems are the things that God uses that we will glorify Him. Listen to me more. I know for me, since we closed the church down on March 15th, I have prayed, unlike I've prayed maybe in most of my life, I have no idea what I was doing. I told the church the whole time, I have no idea what I'm doing. Not here, but with everything else. Pastor, what do you think? I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, you listen to this, you listen to this. It's all, this is fake, that's fake, this is double fake. That's a double fake fake. This fake outdoes that fake, and this fake is more yelling about their fake, and this fake, I'm like going, this is crazy. Facts have left, and people come to me and says, Pastor, you should do so-and-so. And I love people, and they say, but if I listen to you and it doesn't go well, are you going to take responsibility for it? No. Then I just really need to pray about that. But I will say this, that I prayed better, if that's such a word, a thing to say. Problems are in your life. Maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's an illness. We've got people in this church that are undergoing cancer treatment, and they shouldn't be here because of their immune system is compromised, even if the virus was in existence. So we see that there are problems. God puts a problem in his life to reveal himself. He put a problem in my life to reveal himself to me. So we see the second thing. Don't miss this. If God gives us a problem, Number three, 
What could I have done more? I gave you a, a proclamation. And this is really important. Look at John 37. I read part of that in 30, 37 and 38. I gave you a proclamation. By the way, if you have the app, you have a detailed analysis. All my notes that they're not preached on some of the references and things like that. And it's all on the front, on the front page of the app if you would like to look at that later. But look what it says in verse 37. And the Father himself, which has sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. That's pretty interesting. And ye have not his word abiding in you. Isn't that Sith interesting? You have not his word abiding, remaining in you. For whom he have sent him, ye believe not. That's a declarative statement. You don't even believe him. Now, we know they said they believed the Word of God, but they didn't really because if they did, they would have accepted Jesus. The Father has borne witness of His Word. It testified to me. I sent you a pop proclamation. You say you believe the Bible, but it's just lip service. My Word doesn't abide in you. I gave you something, and you just gave it lip service, and that was the whole testimony of the Jews. And we'll give that We'll unpack that a little more in just a second. Your word, my word, doesn't affect you, even though you say you believe it. I looked at the word lip service. It means to say yes with your mouth, but saying no in your heart. An application could be it's honoring God with your lips when your heart is far from him. And that's what he's saying. You know, they said they believe the law. They wanted to buy the law. Of course, they added all these other additional requirements. In the Talmud, you find that. You say you believe it, but you really don't. Your actions indicate that you don't believe it. You know one of the hardest things for people to deal with? Listen to me. Is being a hypocrite. By the way, everybody in this room that's breathing air is a hypocrite. Because at one time or another, you've said something and acted another way. But the greatest hypocrites, you look at Matthew chapter 23, have been the most scathing, really scathing indictments in all literature ever composed in mankind was Jesus talking about the Pharisees and the scribes and their hypocrisy. And what he's saying here, I gave you my word. I gave you my proclamation. And you didn't even listen to it. You said you did. I uh, teach a class, I haven't done it in a while, but I've done, I don't know, two dozen of them, maybe more, of Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. I went down to Nashville to their one-week training and got certified, so I wanted to help people in the church on finances, even a little more detailed, and um, I did all that. And I've met with many people, not a whole lot, but many, that are struggling financially. And they all say, I want to live on a budget and I want to be debt free. They all say that. Who says, I don't want to live on a budget and I don't want to be debt free? That's like saying, do you want to go to hell or do you want to go to heaven? Well, I want to go to heaven. Raise your hand and say a prayer. But, you know, everybody says that. But it's not saying, I want to live on a budget. It's not saying all that. It's you got to kind of do something with it. Should you stay out of debt? Should you make God's portion the first part of your finance with the time? You should plan for the future. You should, by the way, failing to plan is planning to fail. God is in charge of your finances, and we go through all the things about how to invest and what to do and how to crawl your way out of debt. I remember there's one lady that was here. She's moved since then. She moved up to upstate New York, but she didn't have two nickels to rub together. She worked at the YMCA. And she was so in debt, she was paying her credit card on another credit card. And bless her heart, she had a, son, a daughter on disability. She had nobody there. And I felt, I just weep. I mean, Ann knows who I'm talking about. And we, we sat with her. But yet, something went off in her eyes. She got, she got a full dose of this stuff. And she was saved. And she says, I'll do whatever it takes. I don't want to live this way, going from paycheck to paycheck, begging people. The church always taking an offering for me. I want to be somebody I want to be an individual that's financially free, not out of pride, but that's what I believe God honors. 
And ladies and gentlemen, she went through this whole thing. She got out of debt, paid everything off, and was able to buy a trailer in cash, a mobile home up in this upstate New York. That may not sound much to you, but for her, that was a monumental task. Because look here. What was said, she believed and acted on. That same class I taught, there were many people, they couldn't come because the class, because there was a ball game that night. They had every excuse, well, we can't come this week. And they all just fell off the wagon, if you want to call it that. But she did not. Because you know what, ladies and gentlemen? She actually wanted to do what was said. And what Jesus Christ is saying, you say you believe my word, but you don't believe my word. They say they believe in budgeting people, in this example, according to their means, but they just give it lip service. The unbelieving Jews had neither heard the voice of God at any time nor seen the form. This is because they didn't have the word abiding in them. Now listen to this. God speaks to men through his word, the Bible. These Jews had the Old Testament scriptures, but they did not allow God to speak to them through the scriptures. Their hearts were hardened and their ears were dull of hearing. I gave you my word. The Spirit speaks through the word. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this, and I believe I have it there. It says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discern. You can read the Bible, but not know the Bible. Let me give you an example. Prior to salvation, I had read the Bible, but it was just boring. It didn't mean anything. But I remember sitting in a Bible study on a Wednesday night at a church, in a church home group, and they were going through Acts chapter 2. And I had read Acts chapter 2, but I did not know Acts chapter 2. And I remember the Spirit of God now dwelleth in me, and I had received Christ, and all of a sudden, it started to make sense. Romans 8.26 says this, Likewise, the Spirit helpeth with our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You can't just sit here and say, I want to believe the Bible, I want to believe the Bible, I'm going to believe the Bible, I'm going to clench my fist. It's a work of God to believe the Bible. It's a work of God. The Spirit has to help you and convict you and allow you to open your eyes to the things of God. Part of salvation is being able to read and understand His Word. See, the religious rulers of the Jews were so smug and complacent in their rites and their rituals and their feasts and their fasts and their sacrifices and their Sabbaths and traditions and teachings and so distorted, they didn't believe the Bible at all. They were strangers to the truth. So I sent you number three, a proclamation. Number four, and we'll close with this. I sent you a problem. Now I'm going to do a little application to this. I'm not going to veer from the text. I'm going to stay there. But he says clearly in the text, if you look down in verse 43, verse 43. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. Isn't that interesting? How you can believe, which receiveth honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, whom you trust. For if you had believed Moses, listen to me, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? I sent you a preacher for crying out loud. I sent you a preacher, and you didn't listen to me. I sent you somebody. I gave you a preacher. The prophets gave out the truth, and you just walked away. The Old Testament scriptures tell of the coming Messiah, and it's Jesus. Jeremiah 35 says this, I have sent... Also unto you, all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, return ye now every man from his evil way, and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them. I sent you them, 
and ye dwell in the land which I have given you and your fathers, but you have not inclined your ear nor hearkened unto me. You see that? Jeremiah 44.4 says this, Howbeit I have sent you all my servants and prophets rising early and sending them saying, Oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. And then the classic text of the Old Testament. I believe I have it on the screen. It's 2 Chronicles 36. Yes. Now I want you to read this. I'm going to read it along. I'm going to read it. I want you to read along with me. And the Lord God of their fathers sent unto them by his messengers, a prophet, a preacher, rising up bedtimes. In other words, all during the time. And sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God. Do we not see that? Despised his words, misused his prophets till the wrath of the Lord rose against his people till there was no remedy. See, in our text, they say, oh, we believe Moses. If you did, you'd believe me. Now, I want to say this. Let's get practical for all of us. How many times have you said in a church service, and whether it be me or another preacher, and God sent a man, and you didn't listen? Not to me. My words mean nothing, but to what God said. How many revival meetings? How many sermons? How many Sunday school teachers as a child did you ignore that? How many of the Awana workers that loved you and cared for you that were sent to your children or to you? I go back in my own life and I start checking boxes where I ignored it. And it doesn't mean maybe you're saved, but maybe there's conviction being brought here. Think about this. Do you understand why Jesus in this text right now that I gave you said, what more could I have done? Seriously? What more could I have done? What more could have I done? Have you ever had your children and you look at them and say, what more could I have done? You know, I've done everything. What more could God have done? This is very convicting to me. We just need to Thank the Lord for the problem. We need to thank the Lord for the person that was sent to us. Some of them may be sitting in this room. That person that was sent to you. We need to thank the Lord. Now listen to me, this is a hard one for the problems that came to my... By the way, if we don't have problems, we don't need God. We are gods. We are our own God. I mean, I would love to get up here this morning and just start talking about how rotten our culture is. I know preachers are doing it where they're just wrapping, they're ripping up everybody, you know, and you know, all of it, they throw Bible verse every then to make it sound sanctified. But, you know, to make, but I don't want to do that. I believe maybe God has led problems. I don't agree with them that maybe he'll reveal himself to us. By the way, when there's 4.2% unemployment, everybody's got a job and everybody's hunky-dory, we don't need God. Now, do I want what I have now? Absolutely not. But just maybe God is using this in your life and in my life that he is trying to reveal himself to us, and the only way he can get our attention is through a problem. And then we got the proclamation that I said, maybe there's work, maybe it's just getting back to the Bible. By the way, wrote just reading the Bible every day, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm letting the Word of God soaking it in, having a desire to get up in the morning with, if you're really spiritual and you really know the Lord, you'll have a great cup of coffee as you're drinking that coffee, reading the Bible. Somebody says, I'm not a morning person. Who is? You know? Or how about a preacher that's been sent your way? Whether it's me, and you've heard sermons. In fact, you're so used to it, you almost it goes in one ear and out the other. That's what John, that's what God said in Second Chronicles 36. I sent you all these people. You just mocked them, made fun of them, and until I did a remedy. By the way, I'm going to get these people called the Assyrians, and I'm going to get the Babylonians. They're going to come in. They'll make sure you know who God is. And I sent them your way to kind of run roughshod over Jerusalem. So here's the challenge. Our last screen here. What, where are you? 
looked at everybody. What had, Jesus has done all of these for us as well. How have you responded to his messengers, solutions, proclamations, and prophets he sent your way? Let's all stand together. We'll close in prayer. If you would like to pray in your seat, you can do that. We're not going to have a public invitation, uh, invitation here. But if you'd like to pray, and maybe this morning you need to pray and ask Christ to come into your life. Ask him to save you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you would pray something like this. Dear Jesus, thank you for the problems, the people, the proclamations. Thank you for the prophets or the preachers. And because of that, I know I need a Savior. I ask you to come into my life and save me from my sin. Maybe this morning you need to pray for whatever it is God has put in your life. And it, maybe it's not a sin. Maybe it's just you need to rest in his presence. We're hurting people, both folks. Things have totally turned upside down. Maybe you need to come to the house of God, rather than, or excuse me, the throne of grace, rather than complaining. I know I'm guilty of that. God indirect, lead as only you can. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. As Iris begins to play, let's just pray for a moment. Dear Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the word of God. Thank you for a convicting, convicting message I know in my life. I know I needed this. I pray, Lord, that we will not hear the word said, what more could I have done? And Lord, thank you for this service. Thank you for the dear, sweet people that attend here. And let us be people that just do not say one thing, but act out in another area. But let us be true to what God has called us to do. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for coming. We'll try to work on the air conditioner a little bit. I think we got it started a little later. But we're glad to have you here. We'll dismiss if we can. Uh, if you're a, a, a father, there is a book for you on the way out. Everybody listen to me. If you have children downstairs, a boatload of you do, in junior church, please space out. Don't all cram around the desk. I know we have to work on that. But if you could help us out, that really would mean a lot to us. And thank you for respecting us with what we're trying to do. And on July 8th, we're going to open up a junior, a junior, we're going to have our Wednesday programs, the teen programs are starting back, looking forward to that. It's going to be the kickoff for our new teens, and also we'll have the nursery starting on July 8th as well. God bless you, dismissed, and look forward to seeing you next week.